Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. So how many of you were a little bit surprised yesterday morning to open your window and see snowflakes falling through the sky? <laughs> how many of you were pleasantly surprised? Just me. I kind of figured that would be the case, yeah. <laughs> if you know me at all, you know that I'm a fan of winter. I'm a fan of the snow. And that's not just since moving here to Nebraska. Even in California, I was a big fan of winter. A lot of people don't think about snow in California, particularly Southern California. But Big Bear is only about an hour and a half away. Arrowhead, that doesn't take that long. Mammoth is only six hours away. And so I would spend most of every winter doing one of my favorite things to do while I could still do it, <laughs> well at least, uh, which was snow skiing. And uh, skiing is, is, a, is a wonderful activity that I love to do. Um, and I, I especially like watching other people learn to ski. <laughs> uh, the, there's many difficult parts of learning to snow ski. Uh, and, and what people don't expect is one of the most difficult parts really doesn't even have to do with you skiing. It has to do with you managing to get on the ski lift. They also make for, for some great blooper videos, by the way, if you're ever looking to kill some time. Yeah. And the trick to the ski lift is tricky because you're standing in one spot, but you're wanting to go forward and you're going to go forward, but you're only going to go forward by first looking behind you looking back and, and catching what's coming to you. In order to move forward, in order to move up the hill that's ahead of you, you have to look back. And you can't look back at the ski lift with the expectation of staying where you are, nor do you look back with the expectation of moving backwards. You somehow have to manage that backwards, forwards, all at the same time. In our epistle lesson for this morning in 1 Peter 1, that's exactly what Peter is encouraging his readers to do, is to look back carefully to move forward. Peter was writing a letter that was intended to be received by many churches, the churches of the dispersion, as he called it, the Gentile churches that had come up in Gentile lands, new churches, new believers that were in cultures not very favorable to Christianity. God had called these new Gentile believers as light in the midst of darkness, and because of that, they faced pretty significant persecution because of their faith. To continue to live according to God's word, to be faithful to Christ in those cultures, would mean not an easier life. It meant for those Christians a much more difficult life. So many were tempted because of that to casually engage their faith, to not stir the pot a whole lot. Many were willing to read Peter's letter and many were probably willing to listen to his sermon but were far less ready to get their hands dirty, to move forward in their faith. So Peter is writing this letter warning his congregation against living lives of idol worship. Not idol as in a little wooden thing that you carve, but idol as in I-D-L-E. Idol worship. Not moving forward. Just staying where you're at. A life of worship that resembles an idling automobile. Maybe the engine's on. Maybe it's even making a lot of noise. Maybe you even have Christian music coming through the speakers. But it's in neutral. Not moving forward. With this in mind, let's read again what Peter wrote to encourage these believers to bring them hope and get them moving forward. Peter wrote and said, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Look back, look way back. But he was made manifest in these times 
for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Then he quotes Isaiah 40. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Much like we're going to see Jesus do with two downtrodden disciples walking to Emmaus, Peter was calling his flock to faith. Not just a faith that looks forward for the sake of being forward, but a faith that actually moves forward because it's a faith that looks back upon the certain truth of God's Word. He was calling them to set their minds on the incredible ways that God had broken to their life, how He had saved them through the Word, and He had proven faithful to what He had said so long ago. Peter was calling them, and because you now read his letter, he calls us to look back upon the Scriptures in order to move forward. Move forward into the eternal life and joy that has been given to you already through faith in Christ. When we think about looking back, even though we all have a tendency to do so, I think many of us often try to avoid that. If you're anything like me, you know what lies behind you. Brokenness, regrets, disappointments, sin. Each of us could easily waste an entire day, even an entire lifetime, distracted by what could have been, but wasn't. What should have been, but that we didn't do. And we have this tendency to think that if we could just make sense of it all, if we could just figure out what went wrong and provide a logical explanation as to why it isn't the way we know it should be, then we would live a better today and enjoy a better tomorrow. The reason this never works, the reason looking back that way never makes us feel better, is because we're focused on ourselves. If we look back upon ourselves, we will never move forward. But if we look back upon what God has said, what He has done according to His Word, that will always give us faith to see the hope of a resurrected Christ who walks with us even now, unseen, just as He did with His disciples on the road to Emmaus. A faith that looks back on the Word of God is a faith that's moving forward. In our gospel lesson for this morning, we read of two disciples who were walking and lamenting their way down the road to Emmaus. They were mourning the loss of their teacher, their Lord, the one they thought was the Messiah the one they expected to bring salvation in a much different way than he did. While they were walking, a stranger joined them, at least a stranger to them. Jesus joined them. However, the scripture says in verse 16 that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. What kept their eyes from seeing Jesus for who he was? Well, I think whether Jesus allowed their misplaced grief to blind them or whether Jesus actually kept them from recognizing him, either way, the truth is they should have recognized him. But the disciples were so badly wanting Jesus to restore and rescue Israel and Jerusalem according to their expectations, according to the reign of God's rule in the world as they thought it should go, that despite Jesus telling them many times how it had to be, they didn't believe. And much like Mary Magdalene looked Jesus in the faith, face and saw a gardener because of what she believed, so too because of what these disciples believed, because of their 
unbelief, their misbelief, they were kept from recognizing their Lord. How many times are we blind to see the Lord who walks with us? Because that's what he promised. I'll never leave you or forsake you. There's not a step you take that he doesn't take with you, unseen. That's what we confess as Christians, and yet how many times have we been blind to see him because of what we impose on him? Our expectations of how he should work, how his salvation should look in our life that we don't see him because we don't understand, because we insist that his walk with us would go our way, according to our intellect, our desires. For three years, Jesus' disciples recognized him with their eyes. They saw him do incredible miracles. 5,000 people fed from a sack lunch. A young dead girl brought back to life. A storm that had seasoned fishermen terrified for their life. He just tells to be quiet and it listens to him. Not only that, but they watched him and heard him teach with an authority and a power of God's word that no one had ever heard before. It was just over a week ago that Jesus walked in and they were ready to throw a party to shouts of Hosanna. Then in what I am sure felt like a blink of an eye, their Lord was betrayed arrested, brutalized, crucified, and buried, all within 24 hours. That was just the way Jesus said it had to go. That's what he told them time and time again. But they weren't ready to believe. As they lamented in verse 21, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So because they were stuck in idle grief, looking back upon themselves, looking back upon what they expected and what didn't happen, Jesus mercifully comes to them. He opens their eyes to the truth by taking their eyes off of themselves and putting their eyes on the Word of God. Through the Word of God, Jesus was not only going to reveal himself to his disciples as the risen King of salvation, but he's going to teach his disciples a very important lesson about how they should expect to see him from now on. A lesson that you and I should be paying attention to also. Jesus will teach them that if they are to see him, if they are to know him moving forward with the hope of joy and the certainty of eternity, that they need to see him by starting with their eyes backwards looking back on the Word of God, believing what God has said so that they and we would see what God has done. And only by seeing His faithfulness to what He has said will we see His faithfulness to what He is doing in our life now. Now that the cross has been conquered, now that sin has been paid for, now that Jesus will soon rise back to the Father from which He came, His disciples no longer have a relationship with him simply based off of what they see or don't see. What Jesus is teaching his disciples in this text is that all of his disciples from that point on, which includes you and me, will see him one way, his word. As the Apostle Paul said, who knew a thing or two about blindness and faith, faith comes through hearing not seeing, and hearing through the words of Christ. Reading our text carefully for today, I think it's important to notice that when Jesus asked them, tell me all the things you're talking about. Tell me what's got you so down. Tell me what happened in Jerusalem that's so bad. They got an A-plus on their report. They told him everything accurately. They said how Jesus was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, delivered him up to be condemned to death. They crucified him. Some women said he was alive. Some went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. Well, they got the facts right. 
There was no doubt they knew exactly what happened. They even recounted the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead, but they weren't even hearing their own words. They were not yet remembering what God had spoken, so they could not see what he was doing now. So in verse 25, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. If you did believe him, you would have seen that it was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's ironic that in a day today where we have so many Bibles, not only in print but on our phone, in your earbuds, there's a lot of people even within our Christian circles that know a lot about Jesus, about what happened to him. Maybe even you know a lot about that. But the faith we're talking about is not a faith in facts. It's not a faith like these disciples had walking down the road knowing what happened but being completely dejected because they had not yet believed what was spoken. Knowing the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, having a living relationship with him, even seeing him today in your life doesn't come through a knowledge about him. It comes through knowing his word, having a relationship in his word. That is what he told his disciples in the Gospel of John. You will be my disciples if you abide in my word and if my word abides in you. How did Jesus finally reveal himself to those two disciples? I mean, he could have done it any way he wanted, right? He could have done another miracle. He could have wrote it in the sky. But he chose to reveal himself to them by pointing to the words of God. Now, yes, as the disciples went to the home, their eyes were eventually opened by the breaking of the bread. But they would never have seen that. They would never have seen Christ through that bread if they would have never heard and remembered what he said on the night that he was betrayed. This is my body. This is my blood. And the disciples of themselves tell us that. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. But then they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. Translation, they were only able to see the working of Christ in their life through the breaking of the bread because of what they remembered about what he said. And that's true for you and me. You want to see God working in your life? Start by looking back. He's the God that's the same yesterday, today, and always. I think it's worth noting that when Jesus was teaching the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he didn't just use a little devotional paragraph, a Christian thought for the day, and then close the book and say, well, there you go. He didn't tell his disciples, put your earbuds in for 10 minutes and listen to some Christian music and we'll consider that enough. No, he began with Moses, Genesis, and went all the way through the prophets. What a Bible study, huh? I assure you it was longer than a 20-minute sermon. Do you want to see Jesus today, tomorrow? every day? I hope the answer is yes. I hope that's why you're here. If you hope to recognize him, if you hope to hear him when he calls to you, then you must look back first. We have a horrible tendency as Christians to look for something new, to look for Jesus to do something. Well, the good news is, my friends, he's risen from the dead. He is doing something in your life. You may not be seeing it because you're not looking back first. You're not looking to his word. 
I assure you that even if Jesus was here today with us walking down 90th Street and we were to walk up to him and ask him any question, I, I am confident his answer would be the same. He would say, let's start with Moses and the prophets. And I will show you the answer that you need. They all point to me. And I'm here with you. Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, but it wasn't just a checkbox he had completed. He died so that those words fulfilled would be our hope. Those words fulfilled would be our hope when he promises us, I'm with you always. That's what you need to know and remember. So pray to me. Talk to me like I asked the disciples to do on the road to Emmaus. Christ is risen from the dead and he has come to you right where you are on the very road you're walking right now. He is revealing himself to you. And if you want to see that, look back. Don't look for him anywhere else. Everywhere, everywhere else you look is filled with sin. Everything else and everyone else you look to is perishing. That's what Peter reminded his congregation of in Isaiah 40. All flesh is grass. All its beauty is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely even people are grass. But though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our God will stand forever. Move forward in faith with Christ. Look back on his word and believe. Amen.